Ephesians chapter 2. So if you guys want to open your Bibles with me. Um, someone told me today, no name specific, that you know the Bible is just a prop sometimes up here. So I'm making a commitment to use it. Um, not looking in that direction. I'm joking. Um, that being said, um, last week I opened the message up with a story. And if I'm being honest with you guys, that's my favorite way of teaching God's word. I love, I love, I love, I love opening a message with a story because that's, that's how God made me. That's how my head works. I had a huge imagination as a kid. I still behave like a kid. My wife tells me all the time. So I love things that just trigger my imagination. But today, um, I'm not going to do that. What I am going to do is, is open it with a two-word statement, and that statement is, but God. But God. And that is, that is what we're going to build up to today, and that is a turning point of today's section of Scripture. It's but God. In fact, it's actually the title of the message this morning, but God, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. But my goal, so you guys know where we're going this morning, so you're not lost. My goal this morning is to share with you guys through 10 beautiful verses of Ephesians chapter 2, um, the, the, what the statement of but God means and how that statement really catapults us into knowing who Christ is in our lives Continually, If you guys remember last week, um, as, as I tried to learn new Greek words and really butcher what those Greek words uh, pronunciation is, and Pastor Dave and I talk about it, we learned about epignosis, which is a continual spiritual knowing of Christ. Like, I want to know Christ more. And so I believe that often over and over again, Scripture points to, to the glorification, the amazingness that is Christ, and the fact that you and I actually get to know him. And so today, like I said, we're going to dive into the old man that we used to be and the new man that we are in Christ. But let me read this quote to you by R. K. Hughes. Man is radically dead. And he can be saved only by the radicalness of resurrection. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word, Lord. I'm always, Lord, just honored. Honored and privileged to be able to stand in front of your people and teach your word, Lord. But I pray, God, I pray that you allow us to be a room together that reads your word. You allow us to be a room together that desires to know the truths and the depths within your section of scripture today for us, God. Lord, I pray that you allow us to have one heart in desiring to be nourished, to be fed, to be overflowed, to be in union and unity with you, Christ, as we read your word, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for allowing us to know you, God. And I just pray, Lord, I pray that you allow our hearts to be focused, our minds to be focused. And Lord, I pray against the enemy and any plans he has this, eve this morning to distract us from your beautiful word. In your mighty name we pray, amen. <laughs> Sorry, that's gross. I had to get that out of the way. So I have an actual challenge for myself today. Right as we read scripture, I'm gonna go super slow today. Just because I feel like I get over, like I trip over my own words sometimes. So that being said, dive in with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Here, th this dead is talking about being spiritually dead. About being dead, meaning being separated from God. Meaning not being in unity with Christ. But what I, what I love about this section of scripture it is it doesn't let us wander a whole lot of time before we know why they used to be, why they once were dead, why once we were dead. And that is because of our disobedience and many sins. You see... What is so crucial and scary about being spiritually dead is that we, we, we're unresponsive, if you can understand, the, 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 to, to the spiritual stimuli that comes from the direction of the Holy Spirit. And this is what I mean. 
Uh, it, it, it's, it's about to be a year since I left the, the, uh, the fire department as an AOEMT. And every time we got a call with an unresponsive person or whatever the case was, we would roll up on scene. And the first thing we did with all our equipment was do a sternum rub. It was like, hey, man, like, let's do a physical stimuli to see where this person is. Are they alive? Are they not breathing? What's going on? Just as, a, as an initial just, just diagnosis of this person and their state of life. And, and so if the person was alive, guess what? They're like, ah, you know, like, don't do that. It hurts. Um, and that's the purpose of that, to see where they're at. But when they were dead, unfortunately, there would be no response. And so in the very same way, when you and I are spiritually dead, uh, when, we're, when we're separated from Christ, we, we, we miss the stimuli, the direction that the Holy Spirit wants to press upon our lives. And so the important thing about this section of Scripture is although Paul is writing this letter to the church of Ephesus, reminding them that that they once were dead, that they once were dead because of their disobedience and because of the many sins that they chose to follow a fellowship in, we, we, we're to apply it to our lives to remember, not, not, to, not to dwell, but to remember the dead state that we were in once before we knew Christ. Or in, in other words, for some of us in the room potentially, where we could be right now without Christ. And so that being said, let's keep reading. Um, or actually, I want to read what Romans 6.23 says. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, people who are dead need resurrection. But again, the statement that I'm going to keep going back to this morning is, but God. You see, but God is the statement that leads us directly back to who Christ either is or wants to be in your, in my, in our life. But let's read or read with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. You see, you and I were created. You and I, by our nature, serve one of two masters. That's either Satan or that's God. You see, Satan rules through his lies and deception. Satan rules and influences the work of a non-believer because they are, they are still within the entrapment of what sin and what wickedness has a hold of their life. If you know Genesis, if you know a little bit of Bible uh, history, ever since Satan was the first to disobey, was the first to, 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 to go in contrary with God, so he desired the same for Adam and Eve. And so guess what? He desires the same for you and I here today like he did for the people in the church of Ephesus in their time. But what is so, what is so crazy is how it says that he is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. It is, it is a continual reminder that when we choose to not obey God, that when we choose not to submit our lives to God, that when we say, man, I don't actually want to be in that unity of knowing Christ, guess what category we fall under? Under the obedience of Satan who's at work and constantly directing our existence to go against the one who created us in the first place. But I'll say it again. But God, but God is the reason that you and I don't get to be like the rest of the world. The statement of, of, of but God is what catapults us directly to Christ. In, in, in our lives, we have the ability, we have the freedom to choose and want to be like everyone else in this world and the lifestyle they want to live in. This is what I meant when I said that this week, I was reflecting on the person that I was. And as I was reflecting on the person that I used to be before Christ, I was reminded of the wicked things that I did that in the moment I found no conviction in. Looking back at those moments, what do I have? I have conviction, but I'm reminded in that conviction that I am forgiven by who my Christ is. And it reminds me because of the statement, 
but God. You see, it is because of God, it is but God that we're going to see in verse 4 that we're allowed to change complete direction from the way that we were going to the world and changing direction and saying, God, I want to be for you and not against you. I want to live my life super focused on what you want for my life. To me, as I gave my life to the Lord, um, in the foolishness of, of, of my first year of following him, uh, you know how we, we tend to make negotiations with God as if, as if we have a bargaining chip, as if we have a, a leverage in the deal. Uh, I remember in, in, in a pure heart at the time, I remember saying, God, like, like I don't want to follow you if this isn't real. Like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to waste the rest of my life if, if it doesn't, if it's not, if it's not legit, Lord. And, and, and guess what? In the last five years, I promise you, I can tell you that, man, it is absolutely so amazing and real to know that you can actually know Christ. That is the wrestle that I have. I'm so excited for what God is doing right now with, with this thing that Pastor Dave announced the school of ministry because there's a bunch of young adults in our church right now who are in that same state that I was five years ago that are saying, God, I am young and man, Lord, I want to be used by you and I want to bring you glory. And I know that this world revolves around a lot of things, but Lord, I want my life to revolve around not serving you, but knowing you and then serving you. And then doing this. And then doing that. But knowing you. And so the, 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 that brings us to continue to continually keep reading in Ephesians 2 verse 3. All of us used to live that way. Following, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature... We were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Again, the focus in these first three verses is the sinful man. The focus on these three verses is how we are dead, how we used to be dead, how some of us might be dead right now without Christ. But I want you to, to, to read the last three verses, not read them with me, but let me, let me read them to you as, as, as I wrote them here. You see, without Christ, we are dead in disobedience. We're dead in sin. We're dead in choosing to obey the, love, the, the devil. We're dead as our hearts choose to refuse and to be influenced by the devil in refusal of God. We're dead in following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. And look, we're dead as we are subjects to God's anger. You see, you and I were subject to God's anger. You and I are subject to God's anger if it wasn't for who Christ is in our lives. You see, the only reason that you and I are able to stand in the presence of our Creator one day in absolute overfilling and overflowing, unexpressible glory and joy is because of the blood that we are covered in when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Period. Nothing added. The reality of these next couple of verses that we're going to read is that you and I cannot save ourselves. Which leads us to the turning point of this message. I know it's a little early, but it comes in verse 4. It is, but God. If you're taking notes, if you have a Bible, if you have your phone open, Highlight that, but God. Circle that. Underline it and, and, and live by it and know that no matter what your life is like now or was before, it is because of God. It is but God who allows us to walk in the newness of the new creation we can be when we are united with Christ. But God. Read with me in Ephesians 2. Verses four through five. But God is so rich in mercy. 
And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. If you have the NLT version in front of you, it says this, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. It is only because of God's grace that you have been saved. You see, but God is the statement that changes our direction from a life lived in the dead and decay, in the death and, and, and into a life in eternity with Christ. But God is what changes our direction from inheriting the wrath, the anger, the justified wrath and judgment of God into God's glory, being able to inherit in his kingdom. But God is what changes the direction from despair, from darkness, from gloomness to hope and to light, to being able to live in the newness that we are in knowing Christ. But God, but God is what changes the direction in our life from bondage to sin, from bondage to the law, from bondage to this world, to absolute freedom, to live not for me, not for you, but for who our Savior is. But God is what changes our eternity from how separated from who God is for eternity to an eternity spent in the presence of God in heaven, bathing in his glory, finding all the beautiful wonders of all the things that he has made unknown to us. I need us to understand this morning that it is verse 4 that changes the direction for the people of Ephesus and it is the thing that needs to change the direction in our lives if it hasn't already. Because guess what? But God eludes that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. You see, it is the but God that directs us to Christ. And that directs us to the grace that is so gifted to us by who Jesus is and the finished work that he has accomplished on the cross, not only as he was crucified, but as he rose three days later, absolutely conquering sin and death. But God is what gives us mercy meaning not receiving what we do deserve. You see, you and I deserve the anger and the wrath of God. You and I deserve eternal separation from Christ. You and I don't even deserve to be able to say his sweet and beautiful name. But because of God and him sending his son to die on the cross is the reason that you and I are able to fall flat on our face and say, Lord, I am sorry. I need to get back up. I need to dust myself off and I need to continually live for you, Lord. And guess what? I can only live for you when I am equipped by your Holy Spirit and I can only be equipped by your Holy Spirit as so you so graciously give it to me as a gift. But God, see, that points to you knowing Jesus. You knowing Jesus because you know Jesus, not through your mom, not through your dad, not through this, not through that, not through your spouse, but you knowing God. Guys, it's, 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 it's never ending. It's never ending. Ending the, the, the reality that you and I get to continually know God. Grace. Receiving what we don't deserve. You see, salvation is avail available because of Jesus. John 5, 24 says this. I tell you the truth. 
Those who listen to my message and believe in God who set me have eternal life. They will never be condemned. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from dead to life. See, the minute that you and I give our lives to who Christ is, the minute that we choose to not be the people of this world, but be people after the desire of wanting to know God's heart even more, guess what? That minute that we say, Christ, I surrender, I come to my knees, I come to the end of myself, and I want you in that moment, you go from death to life. From that moment, you begin to live your life as a citizen of heaven. From that moment, guess what? You're just passing through this world as a as a witness as a banner as a person who is supposed to point to who Christ is I loved um camp this year with the youth because the theme was uh made alive and we went through um Romans 6 and 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 the whole the whole camp what was for these kids to understand that when they know Christ, in that unity of knowing Christ, they're made alive. So much so that right now with the youth ministry, we've been going through Romans. We finished Acts. We're like in Romans 8 now. And, and it's been an absolute change of pace. As it's a continued reminder of the old man that is put to death and the new creation that you're in Christ and the way you're able to live for Christ. And, and Paul talks about the wrestles that he has in the flesh that I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I want to do. And therefore, it tells me that I do agree with your law, Lord. And, and this beautiful just unraveling of Romans reminds these youth as they're learning to know about God that it is but God it is because of Christ that they are able to live in the newness of a new creation that they are in Christ when one of the girls got baptized this this last time at camp I loved what she told me she was like man I feel I feel like a weight has been lifted off I feel like I'm new I feel like like I'm a new creation in Christ I feel like I'm made alive she paraphrased, says something like that. And as she said those, I'm, I'm telling you, if you ever want to see me absolutely cry over and over again, attend our next youth camp and be there when I get to baptize the kids. It, it, it's beautiful for these kids to understand that the beginning of knowing Christ is knowing Christ. Is actually knowing him, is knowing him through his word, is knowing him as you pray to him, is knowing him as you desire to absolutely know him. When I was at Bible college, I had a buddy who um, had just given his life to God. Crazy that he was there. He had just given his life to God like two, three months ago. And uh, he had wrestled with a lot of things that, that really affected his brain. And he shared one time in a devotion, he was like, man, he was like, um, and he wasn't bragging. He was like sincere. And he was like, I honestly, I can't function if, if, if I don't spend time with God in the morning. And and I allow him to gather my thoughts and, and put my brain in the way it's supposed to work. And that was the first time um, in my life that I was like, God, I can do a million things before, before I say I can't function if I'm not knowing you. And that really changed the direction of my life. Even though I already knew Christ, I was like, God, I don't want to just go through the motions of doing things if I don't know you. And so that being said, the but God in this verse is what directs, what reminds the church of Ephesus of the fact that they actually get to know God, of the fact that you and I actually get to know God. Fellowship, bathe in his glory, read his word. But let's keep reading in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Again, it's just reaffirming the point that John 5, 24 just said as we read it, that it is because of our unity in Christ. Key word is being united, being in fellowship, being in harmony with Jesus Christ, with Christ Jesus, that we are raised from dead to life, that we are able to be seated in a place with him right now you see as we wrap our heads around uh, the first message i taught in ephesians god is outside of time 
And we can fully understand the vastness of the beauty that is God's mind and his full way of working. We understand what we know through scripture, but man, I promise you, one day when we take our last breaths and we are in his presence, you're gonna be like, dang, bro, I like knew nothing. The vastness of your word is, is, is amazing. I could have never imagined this. And the reason that I say that is, guys, you and I can have this constant pursuit of saying, God, I want to live in your presence right now. And I know that right now I am seated in a place with you. Although I am walking here on earth, as far as eternity is speaking, I am already with you. I'm already in, in, in this beautiful place with you. Kent Hughes um, also said this, we aren't raised from dead to life to stay in the graveyard, but to be in the fellowship with Jesus. You see, when we are resurrected by Christ, when we are brought to life, not revived, resurrected, because we were absolutely dead in our sins, and as our unity with Christ was so, we were resurrected with him. Guess what? We don't stay in the graveyard. We don't stay in our sins. We don't stay in the things of this world. Instead, we stay and we move in our lives positionally into fellowship with Christ. And it brings us right back to verse 4. It is but God. It is because of God. It is because of what he did and the way his plan is unfolding for us to actually know his son. And that brings us to verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 2. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wrath of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are what? United with Christ Jesus. Verse eight continues. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. I love the wording of verse 7. So God can put uh, put to us in a full, uh, so that God can point to us in all future ages an example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. Like the only reason, the main reason that you and I get to be united with Christ, the only reason that you and I get to know Christ is to point the glory right back to him. See, we read last week in the Philippians that all things were created through and for him. God is, is, is justifiably the only one that can be selfish and desiring all the glory and attention and admiration to himself because without him, you and I continue to be dust. You and I continue to be non-existent. You and I continue to to, to be dead in our sins. And it is because of the grace, because of his gift that you and I cannot boast on that we get to know him. It's a privilege, guys. Every time that we pray as a worship team, every time that we pray as a youth leader team on Wednesday nights, um, my goal, my thing on my heart is that we never take for granted that we get to lead this room into worship, that I get to teach God's word, that I get to come here Monday through Friday as my job, which is, again, something that's been hard for me to wrap my head around, that I get paid to teach God's word. In my mind, I'm like, what? Man, there has been nothing that, I, that, that compares to giving up the fact that I get to be used by you. And my focus is to, is to feed your people, love you, and love your people, and teach your word. Guys, 
It's so important that we wrap our heads around that this is a gift that he gives us because of what he did on the cross. This is a gift that he gives us that you and I cannot work for. You see, even if we could work for it, the amount of work we could do our entire lives can't even get close. Can't even come close to even coming close to even coming close to earning salvation. It had to be a gift. It had to be a gift for us to have the ability to to reject it or to accept it as we choose to believe or not believe. And salvation is not a reward. Guys, I have a friend who was one of my closest friends. I actually met him right after I had given my life to God. And him and his, him and his wife were, um, were raised in a church where, where God's grace wasn't something freely given. Where God's grace was something that you earn. And to me, it, it mind boggles me how there's people in today's time that teach that you can earn God's grace. Because here's the thing, even if I hypothetically could earn God's grace, there is no way I could live my life in a way where I can continually keep it. And so not only does it add the challenge, but then it adds a, an even more impossible challenge. Because by my sinful nature, I need God's free gift of grace of his Holy Spirit to continually pour into my life. So that I can continue to say, Lord, with my life, I want to live for you. Lord, I want to be 60, 70 years one day. And I want to look back at my life and say, man, with my life, I absolutely did what you called me to do. I did what you needed me to do. And Lord, I am in this place where I've been able to bathe in your glory for the past however many years of my life same for you guys our american culture uh uh, it revolves around of self-made of of i earn what i have of i have the beautiful house the beautiful truck the beautiful things that i possess because i've worked hard for it and that is the opposite in salvation the reality is that it's nothing that we could ever attain and work for but it is something that god continually gives us for us to be able to continually live in knowing him in fellowship with him to not stay in that graveyard and instead say but god I remember the person that I was. I remember the way I used to think. I remember the way that that I thought that as a young man, the thing to do was sleep around. I remember that, that this was okay, that there was no conviction. But Lord, I thank you so much for not only your grace, your mercy that you've displayed in my life, but for continually allowing me to live in the state that reminds me that it is because of God who sent his son to die on the cross that I'm able to graciously inherit this free gift as I am united with knowing you, Jesus. Look, guys, I desire that for each and every one of you guys, for it not to be something, something religious, something fake, something out in the distance, but for you to actually say, God, this is your word. This can actually feed me and nourish me. This is actually the basis. This is actually the compass of my life. I know I'm being a good husband because this will tell me if I'm letting it. I know if I'm being a good son because this will tell me if I'm letting I know if I'm being a good pastor because this will tell me if I'm doing it. If I'm teaching it, if I'm going through it as it's difficult and sensitive topics, God, I want your word to be my word. I want your life to be my life. I want my life to be submitted under your life. I want my will to absolutely decay and go away so that I can do your will in my life, Jesus. Oh, man. What a joy that we don't get to earn God's grace. Because I know if I did, man, there'd be a lot of bragging, a lot of self-confidence. My head would be bigger than it is. Are you guys following me this morning? I mean, am I the only one or, or we're all on the same page that we're, we're absolutely trash without God? Sorry for the young lingo on that one, but... The more we we come to that, the more we come to that grip, the more we realize that, guys, 
the more we're able to put our guard down, the more we're able to put our, our pride down, the more we're able to put me, myself, and I down. It, it doesn't matter to pretend. It doesn't matter to, 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 to anything else other than to say, God, I want to live for you. I want your grace to overfill me. I want to know you. And as I get to know you, I want to be used by you. And as I get to be used by you, Lord, so you take it. Keep reading with me in Ephesians 2, verse 10. This is crazy. Wait, did I read verse 9? I did. Verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the things he planned for us long ago. Let me read that one more time because why not? For we, you and I, us in this room, we're God's masterpiece. He created us anew, meaning we are a new creation, from old to new, from old man dead to new man, new creation, new under Christ Jesus. So we, you and I, can do the things, the good things, yeah, thank you, the good things that who? He planned, not you, not me, that he planned for us long ago. From the beginning. Oh, yeah, my man. I thought it was in the scripture. Um, <laughs> it probably is in your translation. But, but let's camp on masterpiece. See, the Greek word for this word is poema, meaning poem, in, in, in which is made a manufactured product, his work of art. Again, I told you guys, I went camping two weeks ago, and, and, and it is absolutely beautiful to get yourself to a national park and see all God has created and see the stars and see all of the wonders that he's made, all the complexities, the way that everything works together, and then you think, whoa. Verse 10 says, I'm his masterpiece. His piece of art that is still in the making, that is still in the working, that is still being able to be used by him as we were made in the likeness of him. Something that only us can, can actually experience. Angels can experience that. Mountains can experience that. Animals can experience that. That you and I were created in the image of him. As he creates us anew, but what I love about this is that as we are created anew in Christ, it brings us into the second half of verse 10 where it says, so that we can do the things we plan, he planned, the good things he planned for us to do long ago. You see the way that you and I, again, know what we're supposed to do, the way that you and I know the things, the good things that he's called for you, for me to specifically do, other than generally bringing him glory, is knowing his word. You see, you and I can filter our minds, can filter our thoughts. Like if you're a person, and trust me, I've been there, who wrestles with having those, 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 those just, you know, lustful thoughts or demonic thoughts, or you're trying to worship the Lord, and you're like, Lord, why did I just think about that? Like, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I need this. Guess what? As you read his word, continually. It begins to renew your mind. It reminds you that you're to hold every thought captive and bring it under the submission of who Christ is. As you pray to the Lord, it allows you to hear and walk within the power, within the newness that you are a new creation in Christ. The reason that I'm standing here today is not because of any other reason than God is great, that his grace is merciful, that his grace is great, but he has given me a direction in my personal life as I've read his word and as I've prayed to him that he has a calling on my life like he has a calling on many of your guys' life to do the good things that he has called us to do. Guess what, whether that's preaching his word, whether that's being a father who raises your kids up in a godly way, whether that's a, a wife who's a faithful wife to her husband, whether that's a husband who's a faithful husband to his wife, whether that's a son that is to be obedient and to grow up to be a mighty man of God, a mighty woman of the Lord, whatever the case is, we know the specific will of God in our lives as we choose to be in fellowship with him through his word and through prayer. 
as I opened up, I, I, I love that the school of ministry that we're starting is happening because that puts a commitment in my life that I continually have to want to absolutely bathe in his word, to want to absolutely devotionally read his Bible, not to teach a message, not to, not to pray for someone, not to pour into someone, although that's a beautiful part of my walk with God. I want to read his word and meditate on his word because I want my life to be absolutely filled by knowing his plans for my life so that I can bring him glory effect through all the days of my life. But God brings us right back to verse four. If you remember, verse two talked about how being influenced by Satan, we're influenced to do the works of Satan in disobedience to God. And now we see a, a, see a fool turn around that. But God is a change in direction into a direction of saying, God, I don't want to do the works of Satan in disobedience to do. I want to do the good things, the works that you have planned for me long ago to bring you glory. You see, we know that you and I, we know that our salvation isn't earned. By being a good Christian, we know that our salvation isn't earned by working for it. We know that our salvation isn't based on works, but we know that when our lives is transformed by who Christ is, we can't help but let the fruits of our lives speak for who our Savior is. Because here's the reality. If Christ has a God in a hold of your heart, if that but God is true in your life and you remember of the old man you used to be and the new man or the old woman you used to be and the new woman you are in Christ now, guess what? You can't within your full strength hold in or captivate or, 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 or hold within yourself the truths, the depth, the eternal reality that you now are in unity with Christ. As the worship team comes up, as I remind you of the turning point in this message, but God, have you experienced what that catapults you? Have you experienced not only Christ in your life, working for you, working in you, and working through you? As you continually say, God, I want to know you. That's a working for me. I want to I wanna selfishly know you. I want to I be captivated by your word. I want you to move in my life. I want there to actually be a change of heart, a change of mind, a renewing, Lord. I, I have absolutely fried my brain. I have absolutely ruined my body. But, Lord, I want you to work in my life as I choose to continually surrender my life to you. And in that process, God, I want you to work through me. One of my greatest pleasures has been teaching God's word, either here or with the youth on Sunday morning, I mean on, on Wednesday nights or at different places and, and literally feeling and seeing God move through my life. Guys, not only do we get to know him, not only does he get to move in our lives, but because of God and the way he allows us to so freely have a gift, a, a gracious gift from his son because of his work on the cross, we can be in union and allowing him to work through us. That's crazy. So have you experienced, first and foremost, have you experienced that but God moment in your life that became the launching pad for your life to be, to look back and be like, man, Lord, thank you for the fruit of my life being rooted in you, Christ. Because if you haven't experienced that but God moment, it's a scary place to live in because it means an eternal difference. We read it, the but God changed our direction from hell to heaven, from eternity with him, from eternity apart from him to an eternity with him. So if that's you, don't leave this morning without, without absolutely saying, God, I'm done going through the motions. I want you in my life. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for who you are, Lord, for who you are, Lord. Lord, I pray that you continue to allow us to focus on you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your free and gracious gift that you have so freely given to us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you overfill and overflow our lives with 
continually knowing you, Lord. I, Lord, I pray that as the battles get thick, as, as life gets difficult, Lord, that we are reminded of the but God that catapults our life directly to you, Jesus, and how we can continually come to you, how we can continually, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials, in the midst of highs or lows, whatever our life is, that we can continue to be in unity with you, Christ, as we bathe in your glory. As we bathe in desiring to be in your will and bringing you glory, God. Lord, I thank you for not even allowing us to earn your salvation, earn your grace. But Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be people that can point to you. That can point to your incredible wealth of grace and kindness, God. I pray that you make that true not only in all our lives, but in my life as well, God. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen.